wanted to introduce myself. Welcome all of you tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your crazy days to spend with us tonight. And what I am so excited about is that this evening we are kind of escaping. We're going on this journey with Dr. Carol Weaver, who is going to talk to us about the beauty of joy and sound and art, movement, and healing. And I first met Dr. Carol Weaver, um, what was it, like a year ago now? It's been some time. We've worked together a lot. And you were on my podcast, and I smiled for like 90 minutes that my cheek was <laughs> <laughs> Because she was like taking me on this like existential mental journey of what joy is what it means to find wonder to look at raindrops and just understand like the power of nature or the power of magic and curiosity and how that can continue to give life and revive us especially um putting this in my personal journey with breast cancer just kind of taking that and saying you know what we can be pretty down in the dumps sometimes and then when we take a step back and hear such motivational wisdom coming out from Dr. Carol Weaver, I was just blown away. I knew I had to partner with her right away. So um, thank you so much for being such a supporter of our nonprofit surrounding breastcancer.org and providing such content every month or so for our members. And then I also want to give a shout out to, um, you know, I think we kind of ran through the roster quickly, but then I know some more people are going to be joining us. Um, from the U.S. as well as Canada. So I do want to acknowledge that we now have an international presence, which is fantastic. Wonderful. And so many of you guys are just like, I, I want to connect the dots. Today is more of like webinar style because we have such a great presentation to listen to and there'll definitely be Q&A. Um, but we definitely have left time at the end also for people to share their stories, talk, ask questions, and um, Kind of go from there. We have people, I want to say mainly from the East Coast that I'm aware of, um, <laughs> ranging from, you know, northern New Hampshire down to Miami. So I think we got the gamut covered. Um, are there any other states that anyone wants to like shout out? Or I know we have um, Massachusetts. Illinois. Illinois. Oh, yes, Midwest. Wonderful. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I wonder if my brother is here. He's from California. He's, uh, he may come in. Yes, I'll keep an eye out when he logs on. Awesome. Well, I am going to kind of, I'm going to mute everybody right now, just because I know sometimes there's, or actually, if you guys all want to mute yourself, that way you guys okay. have control. And then if you want to ask questions throughout, um, Carol, what's your, what's your preference? Um, just kind of well, take questions throughout, or what's your... I, I would hope that when we get to the last slide, which is this big gong, you'll recognize it. Um, <laughs> It, it is a, a, a less intrusive sound than this guitar that we're hearing a little bit too much of. And we can ask questions then. If you don't have questions, I have some great quotes uh, that are uh, funny and uh, I hope moving. So Fantastic. if you would And I'm also to... monitoring the um, chat box too. So if people have questions they want to put in the chat, I'll be watching that too. Okay, that's great. That would be perfect. Great. Well, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, as a motivation, I love your opening right here, motivational speaker, author, and we talk about your book um, also on our website and on our podcast, and then cancer survivor. So you kind of hit the buckets of everybody on this phone call. <laughs> well, I'm a kind of a survivor. I'm a, a kind of a thriver with a uh, shadow over me. Um, I have metastatic cancer, but boy, am I doing well. Um, I'm kind of the poster girl for metastatic cancer. I like to think of that uh, as my moniker. Yeah. And I'm so happy you're here in this terribly complex time. <laughs> and I hope you're safe and healthy and relatively happy being homebound in what is becoming the Zoom era, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a picture of me. Uh, I it, It's kind of cheeky of me to put this on, but... I was my 75th birthday party, and uh, we had such a wonderful time. It was two years ago, so I'm 77 now. And I got dressed up, and people kept saying, what are you? And I said, I'm an unemployed <laughs> Shakespearean actor. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm, I'm lucky to be 77, even with metastatic cancer, and even luckier to be in New York with this great governor, even though we are in the epicenter. Um, waving at all of you and hoping mm. uh, we'll, we will survive all this. Mm. So let's look at uh, the mind-body connection. Everybody talks about it. It's my wheelhouse. It's where I love to stay, uh, that we are connected, as the Tibetans say, mind, body, heart. Uh, we've long known that hearts and minds are linked. There is something the Japanese have called uh, the, the broken heart syndrome, a critical condition for some people when they suffer a loss, a death, uh, it actually changes their heart structure. It's called takotu subo. It's an abrupt weakening of the heart, turning into something that looks like an octopus trap. That's what takotu subo means. The syndrome begins in the brain and affects the heart. So dying of a broken heart is a real medical condition. The heart generates more electromagnetic power than the brain, and grief can break a body. Hmm. On the positive side, I'm convinced that about a dozen art objects helped me get through the treatment of breast cancer 10 years ago. I wasn't an art student, but I came across the sculpture and paintings that got me through. Uh, it, got me through so many difficult times that I wrote a book called Side Effects, The Art of Surviving Breast Cancer. Now, most of these art objects were paintings, were visual things. Uh, there was one, one, pot, one uh, aspect, excuse me, I just, there we go. I'm on the wrong slide, but we're back to the PowerPoint. <laughs> Um, there was one area that I really loved, and I got interested in, in sound, especially, and music. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, let me go back. Excuse me. Take your time, Carol. Here we are. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is the, this, the aspect of sound in music. But first, let's take a look at the beginning of language. Uh, you know, there's a lot of argument on the whether music came before language or language became, came before music. Uh, a couple of years ago, they found a flute that was 40,000 years old. So apparently music was part of, of our ancient uh, ancestors. But what I think is interesting is that some of these archaeologists and anthropologists say that it was language that came first because of situations like courting or asking another person to help them kill a, a bigger animal than themselves so that you needed a group or building things. Uh, my favorite scenario is the one of the mother uh, in the human race. We can't take our babies and put them in, in a pouch or put them on our back or let them hold on to our fur. So when the ancient humans had a child, if the mother had to do something, she had to put the baby down. And if she put the baby down and the baby put something in his mouth, she had to say, uh-uh, take that out or don't eat this uh, in order for that child to survive. So the idea of proto-language coming from uh, a beset mother appeals to me. <laughs> 
uh, and we, we don't really know specifically or definitively whether that language came before humming or before music. Uh, my, I have one friend who said that it doesn't matter. Mozart, his first language was music. As an mm. infant, he was making up music, and so was his sister. If you want to see the power of language or the power of sound alone, uh, the internet is a wonderful place. I would recommend something called Cymatics. It's demonstrating how music can change the molecular structure of sand uh, and of water so that when music is played under a particular plate called the uh, cladoni plates or clodney plates, you can actually see as they play the music, the way that the shape of the music changes and also the shape of the sand. Remember, we're 60% or 70% water. Uh, so we must have an impact I feel the impact of music as we do when you hear a favorite song uh, or a song you haven't heard for a long time. Uh, your inner chemistry will change it tr as, as it triggers a memory. This is an unanswered question. Now, one of the first medicines uh, was actually a Tibetan bowl, 500 years in B BC, the way that someone would heal you would be to change the resonances inside you. Uh, I have here a, a bowl that might have been played in 500 BC. I'm going to hit it and I hope you can hear, I hope you can hear the, the sound. You hear that? Yes. Yes. You hear it in here. In yeah. your I hear it out area. here. Uh, <laughs> Laura, you have one too. Did you want to give yes. it a whack? It's a little bit smaller. Mine's a smaller little one, but yes. This is powerful. Uh, people use them to settle their anxiety. Um, there's, they are, they can be very, very powerful as Dr. Mitchell Gaynor has proven. Uh, here he is here. He has actually, he's passed on in the last couple of years. He's actually cured pancreatic cancer with the help of Tibetan singing bowls. Hmm. Wow. Here he is with three of them. And uh, he's written a book about this, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> the concept is that these sounds, and I'm going to show you another example of it. Are alpha, theta, and delta waves, which change our body chemistry. Uh, the biggest effect is a calmness. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of these treatments with Tibetan bowls, but um, I went to one and it really is an amazing experience. There may be 40 or 50 of them and the person who's playing it is a professional practitioner. This one, uh, and you can Online, you can hear all kinds of uh, versions of this. Um, it's supposed to be healing body damage. That's what the epigraph mm. says. Mm. Uh, so Gaynor felt that if you change the rate of vibration within a person, you can bring back health. Um, and he was very successful. A 
of kids. One of the most famous practitioners of music therapy um, is Oliver Sacks. I don't know if anybody's heard about him, but he wrote a, a very important book uh, called A Leg to Stand On. He was in the Alps and he hurt his leg and broke his leg in many places. And he was told by the doctors there, you'll never walk again. In the hospital, he started listening to Mendelssohn and uh, he actually, after about a week or two, he got up and started walking, claiming that it was the rhythm of the music that taught him how to walk. He felt the rhythm of the Mendelssohn symphony, um, and that's how he got uh, to uh, he got he got healed. Uh, here's a a little. Uh, there's a little. Um, interview with him uh, that I think is very instructive and heartening. Music has always been important for me personally. I grew up in a musical household. I like uh, music animates me, it calms me, it consoles me. Uh, it, um, it plays a great part of my own life. But I was fascinated uh, more than 40 years ago uh, when I was working with the patients whom I later described in Awakening as these deeply Parkinsonian patients to see the power of music for them. These were people who, when the disease was severe, couldn't move and couldn't speak. They were motionless and they were transfixed uh, and no effort on their part would work but music could sometimes release them and give them a flow. So people who couldn't take a step could dance. People who couldn't utter a syllable could sing. And um, this power of music to release people with Parkinson's is very remarkable and very fundamental. Uh, and uh, music therapy was absolutely crucial for, for these people, and it still is. Um, uh, the aspect of music which seems especially crucial is rhythm. And really people with Parkinson's, due to damage in a particular part of their brain, have difficulty generating sequences, generating rhythm. Music gives them time, sequence, rhythm. Gives them tempo, gives them back their own tempo. Sometimes people with Parkinson's move too fast or too slowly. You know, music gives them back a normal tempo. Um, you don't have to have a music therapist uh, if you have a little iPod which plays music, that can do. But music is very, very crucial for Parkinson's. With um, one of the patients uh, uh, who was very musical and who knew all Chopin by heart, uh, she would in fact spend much of the day completely frozen, usually with a finger on her eye gloss, but if one could get her to the piano, she could play. And she was very fond of all Chopin. She very much liked the Chopin fantasy in F minor. <laughs> Sorry, they go in. <coughs> and so forth. However, she didn't actually have to play it on the piano. If one simply said to her, Opus 49, this would stimulate its mental playing, and its mental playing would be done at exactly the rate of the external playing. It would hmm. take just 14 minutes, and in those 14 minutes, she would be free from Parkinsonism. And the moment the last chord was played mentally, she was mentally. Hmm. Oh. Has anyone, uh, have anyone heard about music and dementia or um, mm -hmm. the popularity of music in nursing homes very often? Yes. Mm -hmm. Jay Catherine, you're shaking your head. Yes. Um, yeah, well, because you know I work in the natural products industry, so 
um, Tibetan healing bowls and all sorts of alternative modalities of, of healing are part of what everybody does. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, this is really a demonstration of what he just said. I think it's very powerful. Breathing in space. Hello. Thank you. 
it all comes back to our emotions and how emotion and memory are intertwined. In fact, this why music is so powerful because it activates both the memories and emotions simultaneously. And of course, that is why everyone's favourite music is so deeply personal. It's a deeply grooved record of the times that matter to us and the people we have loved. This is the Red Leaf Manor Aged Care Home. It's just taken on the Music and Memories project. They've spent weeks preparing some personalised playlists and it's finally time to try them. This is the first day for Music and Memories. So I'm really excited to see what actually will happen. First is Betty, who's developed advanced dementia. To her family's sadness, Betty now holds little of who she was. She's become very confused and withdrawn. She rarely smiles or shows any emotion at all until right now. I'm stunned at the conversation that she had post music. So it was actually a coherent conversation. Um, it wasn't muddled. And that's, I didn't expect that to happen. So if they bring home a, a feeling of happiness, or strike out of the I can't, sure. I can't say anymore, I don't know, just have fun. <coughs> <coughs> Betty was crying. I think she was crying because she was, she felt herself. Um, and if this program can do that, isn't that a great link <coughs> to past, but still capturing the essence of the person? <coughs> anyway, I felt very stupid now. And I think the more you love the music, the more you love the thing. <coughs> it seems such an obvious thing. After a life surrounded by our favourite music, why would we not want that to continue as long as possible? <laughs> It reminds me of a, 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 a talk I gave at a senior festival uh, conference. And there was a woman in there I'd seen in my neighborhood uh, who, was, who brought in her mother-in-law who was quite uh, suffering from dementia. I had never seen the woman talk and I'd seen her maybe four or five times. <clears throat> so. She was there and we sang some songs and uh, my colleague brought over a ma microphone that looked like something out of a Frank Sinatra uh, movie. It was a big black thing. And we were asking anybody who wanted to sing, sing. And this woman with such enthusiasm grabbed the microphone and sang What a Wonderful World from the beginning to the end. And there wasn't a dry eye in the place because she was so transported by that song. Um, never heard her talk, but I heard her sing uh, and, and with passion. Um, 
the, the next slide is about a friend of mine who was in the ICU for a, after an operation, a re very regular operation. It wasn't an extraordinary thing. I think it might have been appendicitis or something um, on that level. And he unfortunately became uh, catatonic. He, he went into a coma in the middle of the operation. So here is what happened to Andrew uh, Schulman. Um, I'm going to go to his slide first. Uh, Andrew is the only medical musician in the Society of Intensive Care Musicians. This is what happened to him. You getting any sound? No. Sound slow. That's slow. Carol, are you able to increase the sound on your end? I tried and it's it's full blast and it's still I can't hear it. <laughs> That's the wrong Carol. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Oh, That's all right. <laughs> Can you hear now? No. Yeah. I can now. Oh. Yes. Can you hear? No. Yes. They didn't know what to play. And so Wendy didn't even know how to use an iPod in 2000. A medical student was there and he set it up. So it just hit the first track. Bach. Happy Passion. My ultimate favorite piece in the world always will be, because of course now, my favorite recording, the 1962 recording conducted by Leonard Bernstein, New York Philharmonic's great singer. And at the end of 30 minutes, I was well on my way to stabilizing. There wasn't a single um, complication that followed. I never regressed. They took three days to take me out slowly. And then it was 3 a.m. And I'm very proud of the part in the book where at three, what happens at 3 a.m. when there's actually a shift, is an actual shift from being in a coma to not being in a coma. All of a sudden it's, oh, you're back in this world. And um, that was 3 a.m. though. So I, it wasn't until 8 mm -hmm. in the morning when Wendy walks in. When she walks through the curtain, I look and I see her and I go, hi, Wendy. <laughs> that was a lifetime smile. Uh, I'm very smile like that again. But then she comes over to me and says, your surgery wasn't yesterday. It was eight days ago. When you even call them, you don't know your name. <clears throat> You don't have cancer. You went into shock and they saved your life. And you're going to be okay. That's what I heard. And for about a minute, I was completely silent. And Wendy has delighted in telling her friends for years that in the 25 years of marriage up to that point, that's the longest I've ever been silent about playing my my song. But I also that goes through my head, which is in the book. And at the end of that minute, I just turned to her and I said, what, what happened to me, you can't thank God enough, or your doctors and nurses or your loved ones, you thank God. His place, his wound, if he needs it, I'm going to come back to you. And that was new, what I'd had to do. Um. He's really terrific, and he, he does wake up people in the operating room. In the ICU, I mean, not in the operating room. He doesn't play just anything. He will play something specific for that patient. He'll look at the chart. Hmm. And all of a sudden, you start seeing the now, the blood pressure is relaxed. His face, you can see it's very, very subtle, but you see in the face, there's a relaxation. 
uh, you keep breathing, it's getting a little bit better. And I think inside, I'm guessing, I don't know, but I'm guessing inside, you're going, yeah, baby, and that's my music. <laughs> So I recommend his book highly. It's uh, wonderful and uh, very inspiring. And he is really doing remarkable things. Um, the, the, next, uh, the next slide, this is, of course, we've, all we've been hearing is his guitar music, which is great. Um, no, I want to go back. Now, this is the takeaway uh, from tonight's exploration of sound and healing. Uh, the Taoists have a philosophy that there are six healing sounds. And Chris Steven North is going to give us those. You can. The six healing sounds. It's a well-known meditation. I learned from my mind teacher, the Taoists, the can you hear him? Or is there an echo? There is an echo. I don't know what that is. Can you hear that now? Is it better? Yeah. So, Carol, I think on Monday, you and I were discussing what those sounds were. Um, do we want to just go through them with everyone on the call? Yes, we're going to go through them. He's going, I'm going to just jump from one sound to another because the, the uh, presentation is wonderful. It's a little long. Sure. So, um, this, what, what they are, and I can tell you those uh, before he begins, uh, he does the lung, which is sadness and depression. And it goes, it, when you do this, you will call into your system courage and inspiration. And that sound is S. The kidneys represent fear and confusion. And when you get rid of those, you're bringing in gentleness and wisdom. And that sound is like blowing out a candle. <sighs> the liver is anger. Mm -hmm. And with anger, he does something very interesting with his hands. But the sound is shh. And if you're really pissed off, you can go shh, 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 shh. <laughs> the heart is irritation, anxiety, and hatred. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the sound that brings love and joy is ha. Ah. It's easy because that's the heart. And he even says that. The spleen or the pancreas is worry. And this is my very favorite. Wait till you see how he demonstrates this worry to serenity and forgiveness. It's the sound of retching. So you're literally getting it out by vomiting the, the worry. Finally, there's the triple heater. This isn't an organ. It's what he says you should do at night. It's hot, warm, cold. And mm. You, you make the sound, he calls it subvocal. That means it's not really heard. It's an E sound. So may I go through very quickly and, and just skip to the, to the ways he presents these sounds? Would you like to do that? Yes. 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 All right, here's the first one. Let's begin with the lung sound. So we breathe in for the lungs. As we breathe out, we exhale the lung emotions of sadness, grief, isolation, loneliness, melancholy. We 
the sound Then we lie the arms and let the new breath flow in like a tide, bringing with it lung virtue. And here's the kidneys. the kidneys. And as you exhale, breathe out any feelings of fear. This is the liver. Breathe into the liver. Your hands come up over your head. Turn your palms upwards. And hmm. exhaling any feelings of anger. This is the heart. Exactly, not on the left, you know, tilted towards the left. We give it a symbolic kind of stretch. And the heart emotions are irritation, anxiety, hatred, that and love, love and joy. So let's breathe in for the heart. The same way you just deliver the opposite way. Easy sound, remember. It's like the first part of the heart itself. It's the spleen. Well, it's actually the, the pancreas in Western medicine, the spleen in, in Chinese medicine. It's tucked away under the left ribs. So it's, it's quite deep, so in order to get at it, we have to go underneath, just like that. And then we breathe out, what? We breathe out our worries. Think of something that worries you. And just let it go out into the earth. So, what do we breathe in? Openness, fairness, serenity. So. Let's go for the screen sound. I'm sure you'll love the sound. Here it comes. <laughs> Six years. And this is for the triple heater. Not an organ so much to function. A sorry. Hot, warm, cool of the body in Dallas Paris. And this doesn't have a virtue, doesn't have an emotion. Trivita represents both between the emotions and the virtues, yin and yang. So we just think of harmony. We breathe in harmony, we breathe out harmony. And the sound is a sub-vocal E. Sub-vocal meaning you can't hear it. So let's go for the triple heater sound. It's a great one to do at the end of the day. When you're in bed or you're going to sleep. Just breathe in, harmony. Sit back. Taking harmony all the way. <laughs> well, that's Chris uh, Diva North. Um, I think anybody participating in this uh, might be glad to hear that NIH and uh, John Kennedy. Um, the, the Kennedy Center and NEA are putting $20 million into a study of sound and healing, including, of course, music therapy. Um, I think that's a great uh, 
it's a great confirmation of the power of music. Um, I, I think that, um, there, well, there may be questions. Let me, let me see if I can turn down the volume. There's my book. So does anyone have uh, comments or questions? I do, Carol. Yes. Um, the, my question to you is, if you're stranded on a desert island and you can only take one piece of music with you, what is that music? Um, it, would, it might be Bach, it could be Chopin, and it could be a lot of rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. for my memorial service which I've been thinking about I would like a lot of rock and roll as people throw my ashes either into the <laughs> uh, into the Ganges maybe <laughs> with Jerry Garcia <laughs> oh, that would be fine <laughs> yes how do you make a comment can you hear me this yeah, is, I, I would just like to comment that I'm on a uh, support group for families of Alzheimer's patients in my church. And the Alzheimer's Association of North Carolina is presenting the earphones with music to Alzheimer's patients uh, free of charge. So I, I've been able to see the advances that they're making and the uh, goodness out of the music uh, regarding Alzheimer's patients. Great, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think I think more people are understanding the uh, the power of music for to bring back their personalities as we saw tonight, um, mm -hmm. and I I've seen myself. So that's great, great to know. Yeah, and I haven't um, experienced this personally. I cannot wait to do what's called, quote unquote, a gong bath, where you go in and you lie down and you hear these people play these gongs. And science has been supporting the fact that the vibrations of the music can actually change your cells at the cellular level, that they respond to this vibration. That's and right. In theory, it can change if we had... <clears throat> you know, mutated cells that lead to a cancer, that we can actually like change what that forecast will actually look like. Wow. Right, it's, it's not so outrageous uh, that Gaynor, Mitchell Gaynor, mm -hmm. cured people of cancer with, uh, with sound therapy, other things too. But I, there's a great quote by Nicholas Tesla. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, mm -hmm. frequency, and vibration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so much yeah. of the uh, universe mm -hmm. is musical. Yeah. And Carol, Dr. Carol Weaver, we had um, a question coming through the chat actually when you were showing the video about the, the Parkinson's patient who was dancing and kind of healing from that. Yeah. Is there a particular, I'm not sure if you know this or maybe we can look it up. Is there a particular like Hertz or like level that people should be listening to with, in terms of like the, the music tempo? That yes, is guess, ideal. Uh, well, the, the, the gongs and the, uh, the bowls seem to have higher Hertz like of 285. Okay. But I did see a presentation on 40 Hertz that uh, patients with uh, dementia if they listened to three times a week to a sound that was 40 hertz, I don't even think it was music, uh, they mm -hmm. had much more control of their language. Uh, mm -hmm. They seemed happier. So there is, and um, I don't, I'm not sophisticated about this, but I remember the doctor who talked about it. He discovered that that was the level the minimal level uh, that had an effect on the brain. Mm -hmm. So um, 
I'm, I'm sure that uh, there's, there's been many more studies on, on this, but it is, well, the Tibetans thought of it as waves, the alpha, the, the alpha, the uh, theta waves and the delta waves are the good ones. Um, and they could change those by the tone of the, of the mm -hmm. bowls. So I think it's a great question that you've raised. And uh, I will seek out when I, it was, a, it was a YouTube, and there's a lot of things on YouTube about music and, uh, and dementia, music and depression, of course. Yeah. Uh, and then you saw the impact on a certain, on a aphasic patients who've lost the capacity to speak are particularly um, re responsive to those, uh, those levels of sound. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful field. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say something. Um, both of my parents had Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. um, they were farmers and my father was pretty liberal with the pesticides. Oh. So, yeah, and um, I wonder sometimes if that's where my breast cancer came from, mm -hmm. because well, I remember as a kid, it kind of gives me the shivers thinking that might give me cancer, but I had no control over what my father was doing. He had an eighth grade education, and, you know, that's just what he was doing, so I was kind of stuck there, oh. and my mother, of course, you know, she did what he wanted. So there was spray all the time. He would drive around the house and spray if there were spiders in the house, all this other stuff. And I will not to this day spray for spiders in the house. <laughs> I don't use anything unless I absolutely have to in my garden. I have a huge garden outside. Um, I get, um, it's, soil from a dredged lake in Puslinch and it's really good soil the guy does tests all the time it's ideal the soil is so balanced I don't even need fertilizer so that's what's on my garden so I try to tell myself that you know in spite of all that pesticide I was exposed to as a child I'm trying to ameliorate I guess those issues um, now with eating proper food and not using pesticides, but um, I also teach at a college. I do. I teach horticulture, and I feel like it's my mission in life to tell people that they need to get off the industrial chemicals as much as possible, and try to keep our ecosystem, our biodiversity, all that sort of thing in check as much as we possibly can. And even if you have like a tiny little spot in your yard or tiny little balcony, if you can do your little part, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's all I have to say with that, so. Thank you. Well said, Linda. That's Thank great. you. Um, the music therapists, uh, apparently there are very few of them, even though Oliver Sacks said you don't need to be a music therapist, but there's much to that field. And there are only, I think, eight in the country. Um, and we need more of them. Because even though it's nice to play music for Alzheimer patients and, and uh, go into nursing homes, I think we do need a more, a deeper dive on the kinds of music that um, will really, really help. So I'm mm. paralleling uh, what you said about horticulture, and I'm glad that you brought that up. Mm. Um, I think everybody ought to have bags when they go into grocery stores, <laughs> uh, but I forget, and uh, so I bring my stuff out in a in a cart, a rolling cart, so I can put it in the bags. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something to get used to, isn't it? Yes. Uh, I hope this this uh, grant for sound and healing will encourage people to take up music therapy like or learn it when they become occupational therapists right well awesome you know it, it's funny carol that you had mentioned rock and roll i'm a a, a big deadhead and mickey hart the, the drummer extraordinaire with the grateful dead 
has been working with neurologists for years on the science of music therapy and, and the power oh. of vibration. Yeah. And he, he learned that as a, as a child, as I believe his, it was his grandmother that had dementia and she couldn't speak. And he started to play his drums for her and she spoke his name. And oh. so he oh. got that connection and he continued to work on that all through the years. He's a big time percussionist with African percussionists and, and whatever. And uh, I, I just looked it up an article that I'll send to you uh, right. just to, for your continued studies. But uh, I've been following him for years and I just thought that there was an awful lot to that. And, certainly appreciate the heck out of uh, everything that music can bring. If I'm on a, a desert island, I'm listening to a Pavan for a dead princess. Oh, <laughs> not rock and roll. <laughs> not, no, I play rock and roll five hours a day on my three guitars upstairs, driving poor Laura nuts. But oh my God, this at home <laughs> stuff. Okay, that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of music uh, do you like, Catherine? Myself, I am I unmute, unmuted. Yes, um, yeah. I love I love classical music and jazz. Um, I really love folk music, and bluegrass is one of my favorite. Bluegrass and Celtic music. I love um, the Acadian music up in um, Canada. Um, so I've yeah, Smoky Mountain. Cajun, I love all that. <laughs> My friend Sheila is a uh, opera singer. <gasps> oh, I love that. What what kind of music do you prefer, Sheila? Um, really to the point, I'm I was one of the first music therapists that was oh. certified over forty five <laughs> years ago. I didn't know that. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, so uh, that was while I was uh, an aspiring opera singer. You know, I was doing that all at the same time. Uh, so there, there are literally thousands of music therapists out there, perhaps not uh, as expert at working in the, uh, uh, the ER or ICU. Uh, it may be a subspecialty, but it's a field that's alive and well. Good. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there who could contribute to this, right? So, um, but yeah. my, my, my favorite music for healing uh, is the flute and the cello. Mm. And yeah. a lot of Bach, uh, a lot of Bach. Um, but uh, I, 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 like you, Carol, I love good rock and roll too. <laughs> <laughs> God bless. <laughs> So, so oh, it, it depends on what mood I'm in. <laughs> well, I, I don't know what, what why that was indicated in the grant about not having enough music therapists. Maybe they're talking about certified in some fashion. I know it took yeah. a long time to be, be to be in, in embraced by the musicians who take care of the ICU. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I I think I think the distinction is the music therapists who are who are certified. Uh, for the work specifically in the ICU, I think that's a subspecialty. So you, you're, I think you're right on that. There, there aren't enough of those. Yeah, well, it's almost magical what they can do. Mm. It is. Anybody crazy about Yo-Yo Ma? Yeah. yeah. Yes. He's my go-to musician. Playing the tango, I love. I love that. I could hear that all day long. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'll well, speak for William and I. We, um, as those of you who saw our newsletter this past Monday, bought a new house and have space <gasps> now, which is super exciting to have space. I have my own office here for SBC, but we also have dedicated a room specifically for music, where oh. William has three of his guitars and I have my keyboard. Eventually, it'll be a baby grand piano, but right now it's a keyboard. And oh. You know, especially in this light of like coronavirus and stress mm. and anxiety, mm. um, personally, I'm like losing my mind. And William's like, let's go and play some music. Like, 
play the chords that you know how to play. You haven't played in a while, you're rusty, but it comes back because of muscle memory. And we had a great weekend just playing music and it's it's healing on, you know, this is anecdotal, but like emotional and mental, like we just, we were laughing, we were having fun and, and it served a purpose. Oh. It yeah. takes you out of yourself, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and it's it, you can you can sense why it's so good for dementia or Parkinson's or something of that sort because music is all math, and yes. it, it, you mm -hmm. you drive that math into your the mm -hmm. vibrations of math into your uh, mm -hmm. your consciousness. And that exploration really starts to drive all sorts of fundamental changes in your physiological makeup. And I, I just think that there's something really wonderful about it. I can't play enough. I know I drive Laura crazy, but. <laughs> yeah, and, and the difference between actually making music and listening music is, is really powerful and exponential. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And all the studies seem to indicate that. Uh, if you can make music, then all of these positive um, influences are ramified and increased. Uh, it's like hitting the bowl. <laughs> it's yes. not just yes. the sound. It's, it's the power of that rust uh, that seems to help me banish bad thoughts. And uh, yeah. And, and of course, being close to it, getting the sound when you're playing the piano, you're, as you say, it's uh, the vibrations are going right through you. Yes, of course. Wonderful. Well, I, I really enjoyed this and I, I thank you so much for putting up with my technical idiocy. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, if you don't do this stuff, you don't learn it. Exactly. I mm -hmm. really, really, I love art, art and healing, but the, but this, area of sound mm. and, uh, and music is fascinating to me so. <laughs> well thank you strange. very much carol thank you thank, thank you. you so much thank, thank you everyone. Thank, thank you carol thank you, everyone. this is fantastic i'm so glad we got to convene together and um until next time we have a meetup this thursday there's no agenda so for anyone who's interested, you can always jump on um, our website and subscribe for Thursday, just weekly chats and catching up. So thank you again. And Dr. Carol Weaver, we are so appreciative. Thank you always for your knowledge, insight, and inspiration. We'll thank see you. you soon, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. God bless. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Great, Carol. You're awesome.